we might have a good connection for a change. Thumb, in Sweden, we hold our thumbs instead of crossing fingers. Okay. I am well, I'm American, working. but I live in Sweden. You do? Where, where do you live in Sweden? Gotland. Is that near Oslo? No. Um, I think that's Norway. Um, but Gotland is an island in the middle of the Baltic. Oh, that must be really cold in the winter. Um, it's actually not too bad. But yeah, it's ah. beautiful. Lots of medieval history. And do, you, do you come to New York City often? No, <laughs> but I have been there. Um, I don't travel all that much, but back I used to be a traveling actor with the theater company. So okay. I, went, I covered, a. we had touring areas. We traveled out of a van, living out of suitcases, staying in people's homes, upstate New York. And in, uh, we covered all of the five boroughs in, and in New York City as well. Uh, but today you're, you're, I'm on Staten Island. Yeah, I've been there. One of the boroughs near the Staten yeah. Island. <laughs> well, I'm just so thankful for Eileen to introduce us and make this po call possible. And thank you so much for your time. But uh, It's my pleasure. I imagine that you just have a lot of stories. I wanted to ask you, what do you love about your job? Well, what could be better uh, than to interview iconic celebrities, uh, actors, singers, authors, and I've been doing it for 25 years. The good thing about it is I think in every interview that I've ever had, I, you learn something either about life or uh, about the, the keys to their success. Uh, it's never boring. I think that's what I like about it the most. I love it, having conversations with people. It's just, it's so intimate and real. And it's like, it's not just the facade of what people know, uh, what, what there's, there's, it's just genuine. It's just real conversation. Yeah. And as an interviewer, uh, I think it's a, a, a tremendous challenge uh, to, to, to somehow make the interview compelling. You know, it's easy to make it boring. You know, you're asking the same old, same old questions, stuff like that, right? Or you can get creative and dig real deep and try to find some nuggets that people would find co compelling and maybe information that they didn't know about that person prior. Yeah, especially when you're thinking about the super fans that will watch them, that they want to get a different angle. Right, what I like to hear is from a celebrity where did you get that, Mickey? How did you find that piece of information? I had forgotten about that. You know, that good research there, you know? That's really fun. And that's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I, one, of, one of the things I've been doing for many years is when, I, I mean, iconic celebrities like Smokey Robinson or Joan Rivers or Dr. Maya Angelou, well, what I like to do is go back 20 years and find some a quote by them, something they said 20 years ago about an important issue, and then say, well, how do you feel about it today? Ooh. And I read the quote to them. This is what you said in 1985. How do you, has your attitude or opinion changed? How do you feel about this today? And boy, they really, that's thought provoking. I love that. Do you remember any particular stories of ans asking that question and people being really shocked about what they had said? I had asked Eli Wallach because he, he grew, grew up during the Depression mm -hmm. and asked him about, he had talked about how difficult it was growing up with no money, no hopes or anything back in the, that the Depression was I guess, 1920s uh, in, in the United States. So after the interview, he asked me to go for a walk with him. So we're, um, Eli Wallach is a famous actor. He was in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. He was on Broadway in many, many, many plays. So I had him on a show when he was 96. So I had asked him a quote that he had talked about the Depression during the interview. And then... After the interview, we were walking up Broadway in New York City. And I said, Mr. Wallach, where are we going? He said, we're going to go to the cobbler. 
I said, oh, and he was holding a bag like in the supermarket, you know, and he said, my shoes are in the bag and we're going to go and get them fixed. And I said, I thought I'd be funny. I said, with all of your money, why don't you just go to like Macy's and buy a new pair and get five new pairs? And then he stopped me, grabbed me by the wrist and mid stride. And he said, Mickey, I, I grew up during the depression. And he said, back then we didn't buy new, we fixed old. And I've never been able, able to shake that. So I, I pulled something back from when he, you know, when he was in his twenties talking about the depression, then I realized now he's 96 and he still couldn't shake that experience. Yeah. I actually, um, I'm 34 years old, but my parents were raised by people who lived through the depression, especially my yeah. mom. So yeah. I grew up with so many depression era concepts. Like you, my mom would save every rubber band and put them on every doorknob and just save stupid yeah. bits of things that you would never use, but you might, you might. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I just wrote a book. Oh, cool. there, this is like two books, but my, my first book was a memoir and it's from the projects, the profiles of memoir. All right, the project stands for the New York City Housing pro, uh, Projects. Uh, but I, I write in the book talking about, it was we didn't have any money then. I mean, it was right after World War II. And my parents came back from, you know, came back from the war. Everyone wanted to start a family, but nobody had any money. So I remember saying to my mom, I'd love to go to college. How do you feel about it? No one in my family had ever been. And she said, I would love that, but you're going to have to get a scholarship because we can't afford to send you. And in those days, financial aid was hard to come by. So I realized early on, if I was going to make it, I'm going to have to do it as an athlete because I, I was a very good athlete. And I'd have to get a college scholarship for one of my, one of my uh, you know, whether baseball or football. So to make a long story short, um, my senior year in high school, I had a very good year and I was leading New York City in scoring in football my senior year. And I'm in my last game, prior to the last game, my shoe was starting to come apart, you know, from the, the sole to the leather part, the stitching. It was starting to come loose. And in, in retrospect, what they did was they just taped it. So it became like part of my foot, right? But the reason I mentioned that was it never dawned on me to go to my parents <laughs> and say, mom, dad, you know, I'm going to be, run you know, my scholarship is at stake. I'm running, playing for the city scoring championship. Can you get me a new pair of shoes? It never, for one game, it just didn't make sense. I wouldn't even ask them to do that. Today, kids have seven pair, eight pair. Do you know what I mean? I, I know and, exactly what you mean. It never dawned on me to ask my parents for anything when I left home to be an actor traveling on the road. Other kids would ask their parents for stuff and I was just like, no, I'll take care of myself. Right. Well, in this case, you know, it just didn't make sense to ask them to go to that expense to get a shoot for one game. Hmm. As it turned out, I got my scholarship. We won the game. I scored two touchdowns and won the city scoring championship. So everything worked out. But that difference between today's economics and the 60s, things have changed a tremendous uh, uh, deal, you know, it's yeah. not the same play. For sure. Are you familiar with David Hoffman? No. He Who is David? He is a documentary filmmaker. He's been making films since the 1960s. I and should know. Millimeter. And he's got a YouTube channel and it's amazing. He's got footage of interviews that happened in the 60s. And I love that. Yeah, I love it. It's so relevant to now. It's so relevant. The, the mindset of um, the distrust of the establishment of yeah. the, there's there's so much to be learned to look back. And I, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with it. Yeah, well, as you should be. And rightfully so, you know, uh, things that went on in the 60s, people, the press didn't dig in like they, today you can't get away with anything. 
as you can see with uh, uh, the sexual harassment charges against Cuomo and and all these people, uh, you know, back in the 60s, uh, that would you they would the press would protect them. Hmm. It would be just the. Right. They and they used to protect even when uh, President Kennedy had his girlfriends back in the 60s, the press protected them. You know, th as far as the press goes, uh, they're much more transparent with everything that's going on mm. than, they than they used to be. Mm -hmm. the, only, the only place that really uh, uh, did the kind of reporting that everyone does today back in the 60s was the National Enquirer, right? And, and, that, <laughs> and you could get that at the supermarket and everyone thought it was just the sensationalism uh, news, uh, you know, rag. But they were the only ones that were really transparent. <laughs> well, I, I, we need transparency. I'm so passionate about vulnerability, realness, rawness. Yes, I like, agree. It's, it's, I agree. The world is like sick in so many ways. And like the weight, I believe, I have the idealism of the 60s. I, I grew up in a way no I, no, I really did grow up. I joined the, this ministry acting company when I was 19. So I really did grow up in this atmosphere that was motivated so much by that mindset because it was, yeah. it was a bunch of out of work actors, out of work Hollywood actors who, or wannabe Hollywood actors who wanted to make a difference through theater. And the founder, Charles Tanner was a military he, he made uh, like propaganda films for the military. Wow. And he wow. was a writer and he wrote 3,500 plays. And oh my. he wrote plays like, like, okay, do this play now. Like backstage, he would write it and give it to them. And it would be topical to the problem of the church. Like it was, it was, people believed that art could change the world. <laughs> and it's still, it can. Yeah. Uh, Matter of fact, speaking of which, Broadway is hoping to reopen in September. Ooh. You know, New York City is opening up in July. Broadway uh, is looking to open. And all those people out of work was, was terrible. Yeah. You know, actors, stagehands, musicians, you name it, uh, came to a screeching halt about 14 months ago. Uh, but now things are looking up. So you, you're finally going to get some guests back on your show? Yeah, I hope so. You know, uh, I mean, I'm still getting them, but I have to be very creative. You know, we started doing in in studio again back in August. You know, but for the most part, uh, it was hard because what I was losing was no Broadway. So people who were acting on Broadway lost that. People were not promoting their new CDs musically. Their books, there were no book signings, you know, so the, all the reasons that people come through New York to get publicity for their new projects. Well, that came to a screeching halt. So what I kind of relied on were, you know, friends and celebrities that I've known for the last 25 years and they weren't promoting anything, but I got to keep my show going. So uh, I got a lot of uh, friends and uh, acquaintances from my 25 years in the business and we we did new shows i'm hoping it picks up now so i can get cutting edge people as well yeah do you think that in a way it made more of an intimacy between the people watching and the people coming back without something to promote but just to talk yeah that's a that's a good point most likely it did i didn't think of it that way but, it, but I, I may have accomplished that, right? Because I wasn't selling anything. Mm -hmm. I was having an intimate conversation. Yeah. So that's, that's a good point. But I was able, I think a lot of people said to me, how are you doing this? You know, everyone else was doing Zoom. You know, but we practice safe protocols, you know, with the mask and the thing. And I was vaccinated twice, you know, months ago. So we were able to do the new shows. Everyone, how did you do? How are you doing new shows? You know, nobody else is doing them. So we were one of the first that came back doing, doing uh, in-person interviews. 
It's like, as it turns out, it's not that hard to maintain distance when talking to people. <laughs> That's right. And we tried to do the Zoom, but we didn't like it for what. It's not what we do. You know, I do that intimate thing person to person. And uh, like you do Zoom, you're good at Zoom. You know, I'm not that good at Zoom. I'm good at having a person four feet away from me, you know? In my, I've been doing conversations on my YouTube channel since this yeah. summer, and I've only done yeah. one live conversation. Is that right? Yeah, one of my, uh, funny because uh, with Zoom is, is, is totally different, you know? Mm -hmm. When I was first out, my mentor gave me a tip about being a good interviewer. And he said to me, one of the keys is never let them see you sweat when you have to ask the hard questions. <laughs> and, and you know what? He's right. I mean, sometimes you don't know what kind of response you're going to get from iconic people. Mm. So you got to be prepared for that. And, and when that happens and things aren't going the way you want them to go, don't let them see you sweat. <laughs> Good tip. I don't, I don't, it doesn't seem to be about like, where were you? What did you think? Like, I'm not an investigative driving the point home. I'd rather just connect with people. And like my dream as Eileen opens these doors for me to have these amazing conversations is to ask people like, what do you care about? What are you passionate about? Not just people know nope. you because you do this thing and ooh, let's talk about this celebrity, but like what, what's, what's important to you? What are you, what's your, what's, what's your drive? Well, you mean personally? Yeah. I just like the challenge, you know, um, the, the chat. I mean, when you're interviewing people like Dr. Maya Angelou or Deepak, or Deepak Chopra, you know, I know intellectually I'm way over my head. I know that, yeah, you know, but, <laughs> gives me such a tremendous sense of satisfaction knowing I can kind of hang in there with them. And I think the key to, to the key to that success is, is the preparation. You know, if you're really prepared, you can hang with anybody. I like if you're not, yeah. And if you're not prepared, you, you would struggle with almost, you can't wing a good interview. Mm. You could try, but it seldom comes off professional and and you know excellent yeah. uh, one, i learned that from you know one of my uh, guests was christopher Plummer. he was in the of music hey, do you like christopher Plummer? he was such a great actor so the week before my interview and at the time he was the oldest actor to win an academy award at that time i think he was 80 something right but I knew how he did his autobiography, which was this big. It was like 480 pages, you know? And I knew it. So my assistant gave me a little packet. She does every episode with research for the guesses coming up. And for Christopher Plummer, there was a post-it on the top. And it was a link to a radio interview. She said, I think you should listen to that before you start going into your research. And I said, I'll, I, I will. So I went to the computer. I put in the link. I listened to it, and it was an interview with Christopher Plummer about his book about a week before my interview with him. And uh, it was from Ohio, a small radio station in Ohio. And the interview started off, hi, Christopher Plummer, Sound of Music, one of our greatest actors. Welcome to my show, WKRP in Cincinnati. Love having you on the show. So the, so the interviewer goes on and asks Christopher two or three more questions that had nothing to do with his book. And the reason Christopher's on the show is to promote his book, right? So Christopher Plummer asked him, excuse me, son, he called him a son, you know, excuse me, son, did you read my book? And, and the report, the interviewer in his best Jackie Gleason, Hamada, 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 said, <clears throat> no, but I've been meaning to. And with that, all you hear is a click. End of interview. So I said, oh, man, he's tough. So now a week later, he's on my show. TV now, not radio. And I started off the show by saying, uh, Christopher Plummer, welcome to Profiles. 
pleasure meeting you. Uh, would it be okay, uh, Mr. Plummer, if I start off the interview reading some passages from your autobiography? Ah, that was it. He said to me, God bless you, my son. Bless your heart for reading it. He was all in at that point. But I was prepared, and I did read as much of the book as I could, and I kept reverting back to parts of it. And I ended up with a tremendous interview with him because he realized I had enough respect for him to prepare and to read the, reason, to read the book, and that was the reason he was on the show. Yes. Oh, that is a great story. I love it. Yeah. So preparation is the key to success in a lot of things, not just being an interviewer. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I, I did some Googling about you before, before um, we start with, we talked and I was like, I read the article between that Eileen, when she had a conversation with you about how COVID was affecting things. Yes. Yeah. So, I said the yeah, last March, yeah. a year ago. And read about wow. some of the amazing people that you've worked with. And I was just like, wow, this is amazing. What an opportunity to talk to somebody who's had such an, a fascinating life. Right, right. Well, being in New York City hasn't hurt. You know, I mean, it's the epicenter of entertainment, really. So being here has made what I do much better because people are more accessible. Mm -hmm. You make connections over, you know, as you interview one, two, three, you know, you make connections and uh, everything becomes easier. Yeah, it's all about the relationships and the connections. It, it really is. Yeah. yeah, I, and I try, and I have a lot of good ones. That's awesome. You know, you, know, you talk about relationships. Uh, I remember I had, you know, the heavyweight boxer, George Foreman, Oh, that's so cool. He's the pitch man, right? He does uh, invent and uh, Midas mufflers and all of that. But he also became very successful with the George Foreman grill. Remember that? Oh, uh, yeah. And, right? So during, it was funny because during the interview, I wanted to talk about his boxing career. And all he wanted to talk about was business. You know? Yeah. And he said, when the people originally approached him about the George Foreman grill, they said, George, what do you want? We want to use your name, your, your name and your likeness for the grill. What do you want? He says, well, I have seven sons. Can I have seven uh, grills? He didn't even realize that he could make, I don't know if he's pulling my leg, but he was going to be happy with just the seven grills. And he said like six months later, he got a check for a quarter million dollars. So he, he, he said, I was all in after that. But he thought it was, he was just going to get the seven grills, you know, to use his name. Uh, but, but he stopped me when I was trying, I was talking to him about fighting Muhammad Ali uh, and, and things like that. And, and then he, went, he reverted back to business. And you had mentioned about relationships. Uh, and he said to me, you know, Mickey, I learned something in business that's really important for me. And he said, a good business deal is never a good one unless both parties are happy relationships. Right. And I said, man, that makes sense because everything today is so cutthroat, you know, and everyone wants the upper hand and they want to win right in business, especially. So he has, he looks at it from a different angle and that is he wants to be happy, but he wants you to be happy as well. And he, that is what a good business deal is. And I said, if everyone thought like that and developed those kind of relationships in business, it, it, it'd be a better world, wouldn't it? Definitely. I don't know about the competitive world at all because my acting years, it was a family. We didn't fight right. over roles. We got, we all got amazing roles. And right. I, right. I feel like I'm just like, plucked out of another universe and put into this one like i'm kind of just <laughs> what <laughs> i hear about competitiveness i hear about the business world and i hear a lot about it nowadays because i'm having lots of conversations with people and i'm also an editor for other youtube right. channels and yes. I, the people i'm editing for are in the business world from different perspectives so i'm learning a lot but it still feels like what are they talking about 
I, I want yeah. everyone to be happy. I want everyone right. to succeed. Well, you know, business is very cutthroat in most cases, uh, but not with George Foreman. And I, I learned something from him and that will stay with me with that, with that attitude, you know. That's amazing. So yeah. as I understood it, your time is very limited. So should, is, is now a, a good time for us to say, to wrap things up? Well, how much time, what time is it? That, how long Please. have we been on? We've been on for half an hour. Oh, wow. That, it, that was like, you very good at this. It, it was like, I feel like it was 10 minutes. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, we wrap it up. Sure, you have a last question for me. And oh. by the way, it was really fun being on your show and you're so good at this. Well, thank you you're so a, much. As we say in the business, you're a natural. <sighs> I didn't feel like this was a uh, formal interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i had one last question for you okay good. what are you proud of well i'm proud of the fact that you know 20 years after i started this show that i'm still going strong within it and we last year we celebrated our 500th episode and, and, and I think the thing I'm most proud of is I still have the same amount of passion for it today as I did when I first started with this show 20 years ago. Uh, and I, I don't feel like there's an end to it. And I like that feeling. I'm always trying to make it better. You go from one interview to the next interview. And in between, you try to make the next one better than the last. And I think we've accomplished a lot of that. And that's what I'm most proud of. Oh, We're surviving business. That is just like a perfect ending to this. So <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Kate. Thank you so much. So how I end my conversations is, I, I was a little yeah. bit preemptive there, but how I end them is I say, hugs. Uh, there you go. And, a, <laughs> and I hope we can do it again sometime. Oh, so much. I'd, I'd love to. Okay, listen, you have a wonderful weekend and say hello to Abba for me. Oh, um, if I ever get into contact with them, I'll, you'll be the first that I'll let you know about it. <laughs> okay, okay. Have a great <laughs> It's been a pleasure. Yes. Bye. Bye bye.